My name is Eric Ogilvy. I'm a senior account manager here with Creatio. I'm also joined by some colleagues we'll introduce you to here shortly. Uh, and today we're going to be talking about low code technology and how it's powering the third wave CRM uh, and why executive leaders should care. Um, I think we'll address a lot of uh, important points that hopefully people have already thought about, might have some questions that we can definitely go through today. Um, so I'll run you through the agenda. Make sure I can get my slides moving. There we go. <clears throat> um, so I'm joined with a couple of my colleagues. David Lasher is one of our partners here at Creatio. He's with Keen360, uh, and he'll be speaking today about the third wave aspect and sharing some good information. Uh, and also my partner here at Creatio, Nandish, who is our senior solutions manager, and he's going to be showing uh, a hands-on demonstration of the low-code capabilities and, and really what some of these solutions look like towards the end. Uh, so I'm looking forward to that myself as well. I always like watching Nandish do his thing. Um, so going in a little bit further, uh, for the introduction piece, I mentioned I'm a senior account manager. I've been in the enterprise low code space for about 10 years now. Um, you'll probably hear me use the word empowerment a few times as I speak today. Uh, that's really why I'm passionate about this space is it is really about customers. It's about businesses being able to transform, to shape and carve their own solutions out as opposed to uh, being told what they have to use or being put in a box and saying, hey, these are your tools. <clears throat> I've worked with hundreds of customers and everybody's a little bit different. They have a different vision of what success looks like. Uh, they all have different processes. And so being able to provide low code tools um, that let them be in control of their own destiny is something I care about a lot personally. So that's really why I'm with Creatio and why I've been in this industry for some time. Uh, so in addition to the introductions on the companies and the people talking about low code in general, um, we're going to have David present the third wave CRM discussion. And as I mentioned, why it's important, why we should be talking about it. Uh, and then the hands-on demonstration I mentioned with Nandish, and we'll wrap it up with a Q&A session at the end and hopefully have some, some good questions and some uh, good answers we can share with everyone. So for us as the host, Creatio, for anybody not familiar, uh, we are headquartered in Boston, Massachusetts. We are a large international company. We have offices in over five different countries, well over 650 employees. Uh, we have a very vast network as well of our partner community, um, of which David is part, uh, who work hand in hand with our customers in a lot of different ways from consulting to implementation to uh, uh, pretty much the, the full scale and spectrum of, of what our partners can do. Um, and we have over 700 of them located in over 110 different countries. Uh, Creatio itself, we are highly recognized by the industry experts, including Gartner and Forrester. Um, we are in the magic quadrants and, and the waves and so forth. Some of you have likely already read those reports and maybe that's what brought you here to Creatio to meet with us today. And really our goal as a company is to create a world where everyone can automate their business ideas in minutes. And that is really how CRM and, and everything we do fits in together. So what is Creatio? Uh, we call them our superpowers. We are at its core a business process management engine um, that allows you to analyze, streamline, automate processes all across your business, uh, regardless of, of what that process is or what department. Um, you can really streamline and, and get things into a centralized source. And we're a low code platform. And that comes back to the empowerment piece that I talked about before, where you can customize very easily, regardless of technical acumen, to create and customize and evolve your applications as needs change. Uh, and <clears throat> excuse me, perhaps most importantly as well, is we provide a uniform or unified CRM uh, where again, all your business units can work together uh, to align on everything that they're doing. Um, have a centralized source of truth where all your teams are working together with live real-time uh, information um, to make sure you're all moving toward the same goals and, and in the same place. So from there, uh, Creatio, the modules we offer, I talked about different business units. We have our sales CRM that many people are likely familiar with, as well as marketing tools and marketing platform to drive that aspect, the customer service piece, and all of those, of course, fit seamlessly together. 
um, to have all that information be hand in hand and move through different processes end to end. And we also have our marketplace, which are hundreds of pre-built um, templates and connectors that are plug in place. You can link in with uh, maybe systems you already have in place or new things that you're looking to bring into your ecosystem. Uh, and it's all built on the Creatio Studio platform, which is really the heart of the low code where you can create business applications in a matter of minutes uh, without having to be tech savvy, dropping and dragging, creating relationships and, and being able to roll out solutions um, in a matter of hours. Uh, moving on from there, and I'm trying to go quick because I want to get everybody to the good stuff. So hopefully I'm not uh, speaking too fast for everyone. Um, but low code technology, let's talk about the market real quick. Uh, I've been to a lot of CIO events and for years, it was always, hey, low code is coming. You know, hey, low code's on the horizon. It's gonna be the next big thing. And the truth is it's here now. It's no longer coming, it's arrived and that's the world we're living in. Uh, according to, again, a lot of the industry experts, low code is supposed to grow 23% just in uh, the year 2021 alone. <clears throat> um, good for me personally and professionally, I guess you could say the uh, global market is supposed to generate revenue around $187 billion by the year 2030. So really growing and expanding. Uh, and some people find very surprising how much of this is already being used. Uh, nearly 60% of all current applications are already being built outside of IT uh, in the low code world. And the vast majority of people in that world uh, understand and believe that low code are more affordable um, than traditional deployment. Uh, development in-house systems. So we'll definitely get into that and discuss that aspect as well. So this I mentioned is what is important to me personally, um, and it's the fact that citizen developers get to create their own paths. Um, what I will add to the other side of that though for the IT members that we have here is a key part of empowering those users, being able to be flexible and create business processes and, and do things successfully IT still needs to be involved. Um, and it's important that even if IT isn't the ones that are building these solutions, they're you know, giving the power to the employees, you need to have guardrails, you need to have visibility into what's happening. Um, and tools like Creatio can provide that, where you say, hey, go create your own solutions, we'll watch over, we'll make sure that you know, what's being exposed is, is correct and you know, helps us meet compliance standpoints and so forth. Um, so again, keeping the power with the people, but the visibility, uh, the governance on the IT side to make sure that things are successful. And if low code is in the hands of IT for the actual development standpoint, having the tech savviness those teams already have, being able to make those changes in a low code environment are incredibly fast when you take the coding and, and different pieces out of it. Uh, so what are the benefits? People, when they are using low code, they are accountable, they're adaptable, they tend to get more uh, tech savvy as they use it. <clears throat> I myself am not very tech savvy, uh, but I like to come up with ideas. I like to try things and experiment and create and build new processes as we go. And uh, without that technical acumen, having low code tools helps me deliver that, helps me create things and be part of uh, building out solutions and processes without having to go back to school and, and learn how to. Uh, code and pull back the curtain. <clears throat> and these, of course, impact the, the processes. Um, you can orchestrate things more easily. You can align these things. Um, it becomes much more efficient end-to-end -to, -end to, to automate and move documents or approvals or sales processes through. Um, and the software itself, <clears throat> excuse me, much lower development costs, of course, much faster time to market. We're normally talking a matter of weeks compared to months or years in some cases to deploy and customize new solutions when they're needed. <clears throat> and kind of going back a little bit to the IT governance and IT visibility and so forth uh, into what's happening in the world, integration can be very important. And when you have a low code tool that unifies different platforms and you don't have a bunch of shadow IT apps that are running out there in the world that you don't know what's going on, and you can integrate and build everything into that one uh, ecosystem, which is being watched and being developed in, uh, that adds a very big benefit to it as well. Um, excuse me. So kind of summarizing the low code and how that impacts the financial aspects of things. Uh, if you've read Forster, um, Gartner, some of the other research uh, papers out there, 
um, application delivery savings. Uh, the example they have here on the screen, um, three years, 8.1 million, just in delivery of those applications themselves. Also assist with overhead, when you can empower your business folks to be able to create these solutions and do them on the fly, uh, you don't have the same staffing requirements to uh, uh, have things constantly on the backlog and, and needing to work on things. Um, the development time we discussed, and once again, the number of custom applications that are being built outside of IT, uh, they're built by employees without those technical skills. And actually something I just read the other day <clears throat> was research into retention of top talent. It's actually really important that people feel empowered by the business to create their own solutions. Uh, so that can feed in as well to the non-technical folks who are top level talent you want in your organization, uh, being part of feeling like the solution and, and being able to deliver with the tools that are put in place. Uh, so hopefully I've shared some of the high level things on the low code aspect and, and really why we're addressing this today. Uh, and from there, David, if you're good to go, I will hand it over to you, sir, for an introduction and, and we'll take it from there. Okay, and let me test that you can hear me, yes? Yes, sir and I'm um, checking my ability to move the slides and Eric I might need your help with that hold on I think I can again. do that yep okay. if you can go to the next slide all righty okay well this is this, this is me and I've been in the uh, IT space for a long time now, stretching back to the Y2K years. And, and in short, I have a, a passion for um, making information technology work for uh, organizations, uh, enabling them to improve their operations and uh, execute better on their missions. And uh, I'm easy to find out on LinkedIn if you want to know more. Next slide, please. I think one of the keys, though, is that to, to this presentation is that well, for the last decade more, I've been working both on the investment side and the executive side and have that perspective, and, and we'll be getting to why that's important for low code. Uh, my firm, uh, Keen360, uh, we're uh, based in on the East Coast in the Philadelphia area between uh, D.C. And, and New York. And in 2019, we opened our office in the country of Guyana in the, on the shoulder of South America, next door to Venezuela. And we combine our professionals uh, from the East Coast and Guyana uh, for both support, bringing about our CRM products uh, and, and delivering our BPO services. So uh, that was fine, Eric. So go ahead, please. So, so what's this? Let me, so, so as I thought about this, this session, and, and how to engage with this audience. What I thought might be helpful is to start with uh, my, my own journey and, and Keen360's journey uh, with low code and, and build to uh, my realization, my, uh, this past holiday season, that low code is not just an incremental change from what has preceded it or what we're familiar with. It is a paradigm shift. It is a sea change and, and in short, that which Eric was sharing with us at, at the outset uh, in terms of the value proposition of, of low code, uh, I'm here to share that it's real, okay? And that's, that's what I'm gonna talk about for the next 10 minutes or so. So how, how, did, how did we at Keen360 and I personally come to um, know that, that low code really is different and, and, and that it is not just an IT thing, it's a business thing. And it's not just a business thing, it's an executive team opportunity. It's something that the investment team ought to be uh, aware of and, and, and insisting upon. It's, it's, that, it's, it's that big a development and, and change in the IT landscape and CRM in particular. So I first came myself, this is, this is my own journey, use that thread to, to explain what I'm talking about here and the insights that I've arrived at. Um, you know, back five years ago, I was CIO of um, Maryland, that's where I live, uh, uh, Maryland and uh, the East Coast. And I was running uh, from an operational perspective, I was the CIO of, of Maryland's Department of Health. And there are lots of challenges with, with that kind of role, that kind of environment. And one thing that, that 
my team and I were looking for, and 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 the secretary of of the de department was looking for, um, was was more solutions that we could roll out more quickly, um, with the number and 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 talent of people that that we had available, right? And I was also doing some entrepreneurial work on the side and looking for the opportunity to bring some solutions to market. And the short story is that upon, even though low code was available, low code came to market circa 2010, 2011, um, I found uh, with one or two people that I did the diligence with that we couldn't build the kind of applications we needed. And what do I mean by that? I mean enterprise caliber applications in terms of what they can do functionally. And very important from my perspective and indispensably is from the user experience perspective, right? There's, there's, there's a standard, there's a level that, that, that you have to meet. And five years ago, low code wasn't ready. Fast forward to, to 2019. And uh, I was in a position to join um, uh, the founder of, of Keen360 and what we were looking for was the ability to a pla a way to bring industry specific solutions in the CRM space to market on the timelines that that we need to do so and 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 with with the capital that we had available right uh, I, I, w w which wasn't a lot right and and so we weren't sure that we were going to be able to act on um, the the opportunities that, that we sensed in the marketplace, but we decided to look at low code as, as a possibility. And by doing our due diligence in the summer, spring and summer of 2019, we found that we were indeed able to bring about the kinds of applications that that we wanted to bring to the target markets that 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 we knew and, and wanted to serve, right? Again, I want to emphasize that, that what we're talking about here is business-oriented, workflow-oriented applications for specific industries that were enterprise caliber, okay? So we were satisfied with our due diligence, committed to Creatio. We adopted Creatio. We looked at a number of platforms, and we adopted Creatio because of its BPM engine and workflow orientation. Eric said that CRM applications on top of BPM are, are, are the magic. At Keen360, we think it's the BPM engine. Okay, so um, that that was that's what that's what drove us towards um, our Creatio. And so we spent pretty much all of 2020 um, uh, going through our own lear learning curves, discovering the boundaries of of low code, what we could and couldn't do, and um, and building out our own uh, products for life sciences and public sector in particular, right? And by the time we get to the end of calendar 2020, we had six enterprise caliber applications, uh, all of which are available uh, uh, for organizations now, and um, all of which um, are really solid. Now, I'm not here to pitch those those applications. I'm, I'm here to, what I'm, the point I'm trying to make is that with a small team, no developers, no technical developers, that's not what I'm about. I'm a solution architect. Um, that's not what Keen360 is about. We're not technical developers or specialists. We have partners who are that we bring to bear, but we're, we know industries, we know workflow, we know change, organizational change management, stakeholder management, and we now have half a dozen products um, uh, that we brought to bear with low code, could not have been done any other way previously. And so that led, so that's that's how we start 2021, and that led to the aha, a, a moment of reflection over the holidays of how did this happen, and isn't it different? And that's what led to the the, the belief that we're in a third wave in CRM. Um, before I before Eric, I asked for the next slide. Um, I'm going to show my coffee mug, right? And and this third wave CRM, it's inspired by the coffee industry and folks might, you know, first, first wave coffee, Folgers, second wave Starbucks, and third wave is, is, is the many artisanal coffee shops that have popped up in the last handful of years. Well, I think we're in a big, you know, it's still CRM, I'm still coffee, right? We're still talking CRM, but it is materially different and better is my proposition, okay? But let's, so I'm gonna go through two slides. Next slide, um, please, Eric. 
is is what is third wave CRM and then why is it better? And 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 I'm speaking to the executive team and 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 for the, the board and investment teams. I have some, a little bit of background in in VC and and PE spaces, uh, venture capital and, and private equity. And why should they would those folks care? So wave one um, with CRM was the rise of the database and folks who like me have been who have been in 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 the industry for a while will recognize uh, maybe all of all of the logos here. I myself started with Vantif um, uh, back in the day. And and Wave One had held a lot of promise, and but ended up being, um, I think, disappointing in the end, at least for larger size organizations, in the sense that it was too expensive, too unwieldy. Um, in in decent sized organizations, the sales forces didn't get what they wanted. It was really more like getting manacles um, and 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 iron balls on the on on the ankles than than getting liberty and, and empowerment to use uh, Eric's word empowerment um, and and so and so that gave way people when, when the downturn post 9/11 downturn happened CRM projects and investment got canceled all over the industry um, and something new had to happen and that something new happened pretty quickly it was really the internet so salesforce and netsuite had had started in 1999 i believe and were available as alternatives and in my own experience working at ibm and serving fortune 1000 fortune 500 types of companies is that is that there was a great deal of dissatisfaction with with the wave 1 solutions and platforms so that about 2008 9 10 there was kind of this pivot to Salesforce, right? Um, Salesforce became, it had been around, but, but about that time, it started finding adoption in the enterprise. And, and now it's dominant, if not domineering in the market and defines what wave two is. And let's be clear about what wave two is and isn't. It's frankly not about the technology in, in my estimation. Uh, the, the, the reason for the success of wave two, the adoption of Salesforce was, uh, I think, especially at the outset, there wasn't, a whole lot of functionality to Salesforce, um, at least for the enterprise, right? But but the magic, and it was real magic, is that um, the upfront costs of, of of the Wave One platforms were dispensed with with the per user per per month or per year fees, and the complexities of the data center were removed, right? So basically, with a credit card and and a month or two of time, you could have your platform. That 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 was the genius. But what's Wave Three? So wave three, wave three is is plenty of vendors, right? There are plenty of good vendors uh, besides Creatio. I already shared why why Keen 360 we uh, we adopted Creatio as the workflow engine, the BPM the BPM engine and the workflow orientation. But um, some other good Power Automate, in case folks don't know, is the Microsoft um, set of applications in in this space. So what what's the magic here? It is that you can truly build enterprise class applications with citizen developers, non-technical folks, um, and do so quickly and affordably um, and in ways that mitigate risk. In other words, you don't have to you don't have to aim for the ocean. You can build um, you can build a, 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 a lake, if you will. I, I don't mean to use the metaphors from BI, but I just did, right? So, so let's go on to the next slide. Um, th th that's kind of the, the short history of CRM. Uh, uh, but but what, what makes it better? And I'm gonna build from one to five here th that folks can see. Uh, it is that you get more agility. There, there is tech, there is platform true true platform agility. I remember back in the the outset of of wave two when Salesforce was entering the um, enterprise, and I, my background was mostly Siebel, but and um, I remember the um, the shock at uh, uh, learning that with Salesforce you could go in, use a few tools, hit a couple buttons, and within a couple of minutes, you added a new field to a screen, right? Well, low code allows you to do that, but it allows you to do tremendously more as well, right? Those wizards, the deploying the field, making changes on the fly, um, it, it, it's different with low code because you can build whole processes that are supported across internal and external stakeholders 
in one tool set without you know, Salesforce, you're going to end up engaging in app exchange and force.com um, coding. Totally not necessary with these, these new Wave 3 low-code platforms. The cost is also considerably um, more attractive, is, is what I will say. Um, uh, Salesforce, in the end, it, it, avoid, it removed the large upfront costs in implementation and, and license fees that CFOs had to approve and absorb uh, and didn't like doing. Uh, but where we are right now in the market is that, especially for enterprises, Salesforce is actually pretty expensive. And as soon as you start adding capabilities um, for workflow, and then I want approvals, that's something else. And then I want my email integration, that's something else. The, the the bill starts to accumulate, right? And whether whether it's Creatio or other platforms, with low code you have more comprehensive suites. You have suites that weren't pulled together by acquisition over time, as you have with Salesforce. You have natively, you, you have unified platforms that have grown over time are easier for the vendor, less costly for the vendor to maintain. Therefore less costly for them uh, to, to price into the marketplace. So, and then implementation is faster and, and that reduces the professional fees uh, with, with implementation. Three, um, at Keen360, as I've said about half a dozen times right now, um, we're very workflow oriented. And so on some, but not all uh, low code platforms, this is, this is something that is more readily achievable. Stake, Stakeholder-oriented, workflow-oriented solutions configured by non-technical uh, resources, this is different. I'm not saying it's still coffee, right? I'm not saying you can't do it with Wave 2 platforms and solutions. I'm saying that the ability to do so with low code is vastly changed, okay? For user adoption, um, you can't achieve the 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 the, the value case, uh, uh, realize the value case that justified an investment for a platform, if in the end you don't get user adoption. Uh, I, I think that's obvious, but a lot of times it's not said. Um, and the fact of the matter is that there's a lot of wave two applications out there that aren't didn't find adoption, aren't getting used, became relatively shelfware like wave one did, and there is a vast difference with um, the modern um, uh, low-code platforms, uh, mobility from the out, born, born cloud, mobile native. Uh, but what's most important is that precisely because you can have bespoke tailored solutions for your different user groups and respond on even shorter cycles than possible with Wave 2 platforms to feedback and changes in circumstances, your users don't need to be forced to um, adopt these solutions or use these solutions. They, because these solutions are more likely to help them actually do their jobs more efficiently and effectively, uh, the, 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 there's uptake, there's, there's, there's organic uptake, right? Still, still training to be done, um, but more opportunity to focus on that training. So that's different. And then number five here, let me wrap up with a few words before handing it over to Nandish to show how this all comes about. Number five is, uh, it, might, it might look the same as number one here, but what we're really talking about is organizational agility and optimization. I, I wanna to speak to a couple of e examples. This is, what, this is what my aha was when I stood back from what we at Keen360 were doing throughout 2020, and I said, wow, what is it that we accomplished here? What is different? And I try to, what, this is it, number five. It, and remember, I, I'm just speaking as someone who is a CI, has been plenty of CIOs and executive roles trying to make IT work for organizations, including on the, on the investment side. What, what's different here is, this first bullet is a little bit jargony, real options. It's, it's the, it's the ability to create options, you know, not obligate. It's the ability to create to be ready for change or in advance of change, whether it's traditional requirements or circumstantial 
changes. And the pandemic is the most obvious recent example of the need to be ready for change. But any organization that, that's subject to um, statutory regulatory environment framework knows that public entities change the regulations all the time, right? Need to be ready for that. Um, with low code, being ready for change or responding to change is more feasible than ever, which should perk up the ears of the CEO, the COO, and the CFO, not just the CIO, right? Uh, getting to, uh, so well, about one, one or two more points on this, but let me give two more examples of, of what's different for organizational op optimization. I submit, as a former CIO who dreads and abhors, as I wrote in a white paper, um, both application proliferation and shadow IT. Okay, um, those those are the enemies of the organization um, over the medium to long term. But what low code is able to do? Why does it happen? Why does shadow IT happen? Why in the the the, the bullet points was 60% of applications being built outside of IT? because the rest of the organization outside of IT, it, it can't get IT to move fast enough or deliver solutions that are tailored to the business. Low code addresses both of those problems, right? It becomes a way to, to get IT and the business side working together more collaboratively and effectively than ever before. So that's, that's one point. On the application con consolidation, I think in many organizations, especially the larger organizations, it's been taken too far in many cases, such that the main group within a sales organization, the field sales organization, they're dominant, they're paying the bills, the functionality is all adapted to that one team or part of the organization, it makes rational sense, but it leaves other parts of the organization that are involved in, in sales, right? account managers, key account managers, strategic account managers, <laughs> absolute product product managers but they don't need the same functionality as the field sales force right um with low code there is a a very real possibility to have to have a sales force have an sap as the battleship in the fleet and complement it selectively um with a CRM application that's tailored to other groups involved in sales that have different needs, right? This, without tilting all the way into application um, proliferation. And then one last point, a lot of growth organizations, they need, they're dynamic, they don't want to leap to a big platform. Um, they know they might grow into it, um, but for some number of years, they need a bridge that is another place that low code can be a great fit. So, so that's that's why it is different and it is it, it is better and why executives um, ought to be interested and in, in getting their IT um, involved. Uh, I think at this point with, with experiences over the last 18 months that, that low code, it is actually irresponsible for organizations not to um, adopt uh, start on the journey to low code. So how to do so, wrap up in 60 seconds and hand it over to um, Nandish. Uh, Eric? So these thoughts are, are uh, um, uh, summarized in a white paper we released uh, last week. It's at the URL down below, uh, easy enough to find. Drop us a note. We have, if you want to see how these low code applications look and do they meet the enterprise um, standard, uh, Weekend 360 have some summary overview videos um, of these solutions on our YouTube channel at the URL that's here. And then here's the key. Like, like I said, I think it is actually a dereliction of duty not to get started uh, with low code in any medium or large size organization. So I'd say watch the demo by Nandish next. I ate a little bit into his time and apologize for that, Nandish. Get a trial instance, work with a Creatio, work with the Keen 360 to um, get through the early learning curves. There are plenty of other options uh, out there, but, but most of all, um, get started with the low code is the, um, the encouragement here. Nandish, with uh, apologies for going a little bit long, 
let me hand it over to you to show how this all works. And then Disha's gonna be showing us not just a CRM application, but one that's um, kind of HR oriented, which only reinforces the point of how these applications can serve, solve many problems or pain points within an organization. So Nandish, over to you. Thank you, David. Can you hear me okay, by the way? I can, yes. Wonderful, wonderful. Actually, I was very interested in your uh, presentation because I was kind of hooked on your coffee analogy because I live in Groton, Massachusetts and we treasure our local coffee shops. We don't like Starbucks over here. <laughs> Now, I, I do actually have a, a personal story that I want to share before I get into the demo. Uh, prior to coming to Creatio and even learning there was something called a low code, uh, I was more on the second wave, right? It was all about CRM. Um, and then to see the transition happen right around 2019, where most of our pros prospects were more on CRM side. And of late in 2020, we actually closed a big bank in uh, Guatemala. Uh, that was focused more mostly on loan act calculations. So it was all low code. They're still with low code. Now they're expanding into other areas of the banking industry. So I thought that was pretty powerful. So with that, let me introduce a very, a very short demo of Creatio. And I'm going to highlight the key themes, David, that you talked about of agility, workflows, orientation, and user adoption. I'll do my level best to do justice to the great presentation that you had. So. Um, as you can see from the screen, um, I am showing you the human resources part of the Creatio platform, right? So what that means is uh, companies or uh, different de departments are going to submit their budgets to the uh, financing department. It could come from IT, it could come from HR, whatever that may be. And when we are looking into the candidate applicant tracking system, so this is not considered as a standard CRM. As a matter of fact, this could be an HCM uh, use case, right? But what, Eric, uh, what, what David was talking about uh, was the fact that this is uh, the third wave of CRM. So traditionally, there is still the marketing component where you can do drip campaigns instead of Creatio. Uh, you can do sales management where you can take those leads, convert those into opportunities, order management, contract management, all of that. Uh, and then, of course, there is a full-blown service uh, module as well where you can do some case management, uh, uh, do some IT asset management in terms of identifying problems, changes, releases, queue management, you name it. But where the third wave of CRM comes in is the ability to bring in that studio component where you can build business processes that can solve certain business issues, right? And from that perspective, we're gonna focus on human resources. We're gonna look into the candidate management system, right? So I created a simple candidate, David. David wants to come into Creatio, right? And we're going to offer him a lot of money, right? But then there's a lot of workflows that happens behind that, right? So when, when an applicant comes into the system, there is an interview by the recruiter. Then the team has to do the interview. Once both of them give their thumbs up, it goes into background checks. And then the offer comes through and then it is onboarded and then a record gets created instead of Creatio and then the employee onboarding process starts. So they're all interconnected workflows, independent, but they're all interconnected. Now, uh, David talked about the agility part of it. So I'm gonna give you a high level overview of how low code can enable that. So this page that you're looking at from the candidate perspective, how do we do that? How do you quickly make changes to it? Well, for that, as long as you're a system administrator, we provide you a page designer, right? And that page designer does not require you to have any um, any of the software codes. Oh, by the way, I forgot to mention that if you have any questions as I'm showing you this demo, feel free to put that into the chat window um, and we'll be happy to answer that subsequently when I'm done here. Okay, so as you can see, this, this is basically the candidate page. Uh, the, the name hiring manager candidate basically reflects everything in here, name hiring manager candidate. If you don't like that or if you want to add additional data, like for example, if you want to add a new active processes or create it by, simply drag and drop. That's how simple it is to create a low code platform, right? And of course, if those are not existing data, all you have to ask yourself is what kind of new data that you want to bring in. Is it a Boolean operation, like a checkbox, a date timestamp or an integer, maybe it is the employee ID uh, or the employee salary, that is a decimal place, a lookup, which is basically selecting from a bunch of uh, pre-populated options or a string, whatever that may be, simply drag and drop that. That's how simple it is. And then we will say, how do you want to reflect that in the database? How long should that uh, character sh should be restricted to? 
We don't want people to write essays, obviously, so no, maybe not unlimited text string, restrict them to 50 characters, things like that. So all of that is drag and drop. And that's what uh, David was talking about from an agility perspective. Drag and drop functionality, we live and breathe low code that quickly, right? That's number one. Number two is the workflow in here, right? So how, what are the various tasks that should be happening as we go into different stages of, of uh, applicant tracking system, right? So for, for example, in the new stage, recruiter stage, there are different steps that needs to happen. So what we do is we give you the ability to create those kinds of workflows very easily, right? And not only easily, um, so this is called the unstructured business process. So for example, when it goes to the background checks, I want to schedule a background check with the agency. I want, I want to then share the background results with the candidate. And then I want to go into the offer letter. But if you want to extend that, if you want to maybe get an approval before you go submit the offer letter, that's easy. Just select approval stage, simply click on that. A uh, uh, dialog box opens on the right-hand side. Again, basic English, nothing complex, no coding required. And this is the low code part that David was talking about, right? But there are other such certain situations where you may have to have certain amount of logic, right? So for example, offer negotiations is a little bit more, I would say not, not straightforward process. So what we are doing in here is we are giving you a studio application. Now using studio applications, you can simply drag and drop uh, any things like that. For, for example, in this case, we are basically reading the candidate record. If you simply double click on that, uh, you'll get an object on the right hand side, a dialog box to say, what should you do with that candidate? You're simply reading them, uh, reading that candidate data. Then we are creating a task to discuss the offer. And then we are popping up a dialog box and asking what happened with the candidate? Did the candidate accept the offer? Did they reject the offer? Or did they want to negotiate the offer? If the answer is yes, we, we pull the candidate to the final stage. If they say no, we're going to reject the candidate. But if the answer is negotiate the offer, then we're going to go through this infinite loop until we get a yes or a no from the candidate. So those kinds of you know, logical statements can be easily done uh, using low code technology. Now, oftentimes at this point of time, I get to ask questions about what if the data is residing in a third party system? Well, we got the answer for that too. It's called web service, right? So we are completely web service enabled, drag and drop. And if you want to you know, uh, pull that in here, simply pull that in here and then drag another arrow. That's how simple it is to make changes on the fly. Agility, workflow orientation, and this all ties into that use, user adoption story that David was talking about. Then of course, ev these are great things, but eventually can we measure things like that, right? And for that, we have dashboards. Again, dashboards, as you can see, if that data resides in Creatio, you'll be able to build dashboards on the fly. So in this case, you're seeing an object that is created for a case. Uh, you can filter it by different, um, you know, uh, different timelines, for example. I can say, show me, um, you know, uh, who is being done by, by a particular contact. Um, or I can say, sh uh, show it to me uh, from a, um, a different timeline perspective, right? When was these times created? Was that previous month, current month, a specific month, half year, quarterly? So you can see that these kinds of dynamic dashboards can be done very, very quickly. Again, low code, no, no coding required whatsoever. So in the remainder of a couple of minutes, let me walk you through the actual user experience, right? Because user experience has direct correlation with user adoption. So let's go ahead and get David Lasher on board, right? So let's start with a new step. As soon as we do that, it starts saying that, hey, schedule a call with the candidate, right? So we're gonna do that as a recruiter. Uh, we complete that task. And then what is basically happening is now we are providing guide rails to the end user to say that, hey, from a business process perspective, I need you to do these basic things, right? So we're now letting the recruiter say that, hey, you need to schedule and collect feedback about the candidate. So for that, we also we can also have that uh, you know um, some sort of a marketplace application that you can download. I can say David uh, Recruiter in here. Um, these are all can be uh, tagged directly into the um, into the object. So you can say that I am now doing a recruiter interview there, and then as soon as I start the interview, when I call the candidate, I get a list of standard questions that as a recruiter I should be asking, right? And they can be text filled, they can be radio buttons, whatever that may be. Um, and once that uh, you know interview is done, uh, and I say, well, I've completed this task as a recruiter, then basically what we're gonna say is, we're gonna pop up a question to say that, do you want to move the candidate to the next round, yes or no? And if the answer is yes, 
then automatically we will move that to the team interview stage. We will then discuss, uh, set up a meeting with the hiring manager. The hiring manager, of course, will do their own uh, interview process. So, but as you can see, uh, it is a guided process that is going on step by step and then giving uh, guidelines uh, basically to what should happen. So we'll, we'll skip that and let's go to a background check. And for example, um, if I try to go to the offer stage, uh, basically it should give me an error saying that listen, this background check is extremely important before we can uh, off make an offer to the candidate, right? So those kinds of governance in terms of workflows can also be attributed very easily using, uh, using the low code technology, right? So once the background check uh, has been scheduled with the agency, then we will share the background results with the candidate. And now we will then go ahead and make an offer to the candidate, right? And now if you recall, a couple of minutes earlier, I had shown you how that negotiate offer goes through. It's basically a closed loop until we get a yes or a no from the candidate, right? So we are at that stage at this particular time, we have kicked off that business process to say that let's schedule a call to discuss the offer. And once this offer has been done, we, we're going to be prompted by a question to say that, hey, what did the candidate do? Did they say yes, no, or negotiate the offer? If history is to go anything from what I have been experiencing with, you always want to negotiate, right? Everybody wants something more, maybe more vacation hours, whatever that may be. And that, if that's the case, great, let's go back and schedule a time with the hiring manager. And then notice that we are putting two days. Now you also might notice that the timeline in here has automatically picked up two days from now on. It is March 20th. So that way we are telling the recruiter that, hey, listen, you have two days to go back and give the answer back to the applicant uh, with, within two days or so. Again, these things are all configurable, uh, not a big deal. Um, so, but, but, but basically the bottom line is the, uh, the process workflow that, that is going for each organization, right? And now that we have the offer from the hiring manager, we now discuss a new offer to the candidate. Uh, we will complete that. Um, and now we'll say that again, hey, what happened now? Is the candidate accepting the offer? Of course, David is a nice guy. He's gonna accept the offer, obviously, right? Um, and now we have automatically uh, sent it off to the hiring manager. And then we said that, hey, we are now going to kick off the employee onboarding process. Now, what did we do in the background? Well, in the background, we have created a new employee called David Lasher. All of this is happening through low code business process. And then if you simply go to the David Lasher employee record in the background, now we are kicking off the onboarding process also. So now you can see that how we are connecting different workflows systematically, right? Starting from getting the budget approved to make that hiring. Then we go through the candidate applicant tracking system from, from the process of uh, interviews, background checks, and all of that. And once there is a successful offer made, then we're going to create an employee record in the HR system. And then we're going to kick off an employee onboarding process to say that, well, let's collect W2, let's assign a equipment, let's assign laptops, let's assign building passes. So this kind of workflow is can be seamlessly done inside of 3ATIO. So I, I know that I took about, I don't know, roughly, I, I don't know how long, David, maybe seven, 10 minutes, I, I don't know. Um, but uh, I just wanted to give you guys a quick and a fast um, uh, preview of what is possible, the art of the possible using local technology inside of Creatio. David or Eric, do you want to add any flavor to what I just showed here? Uh, That's all two... great to me. Yeah, go ahead, David, uh, if you want to jump in, if you have uh, thoughts. Yeah, yeah. Two, two thoughts. Um, one is, I, I want to emphasize that you know I didn't build what you um, just shared with us, um, Nandish. And, um, but you know I, I know the platform. I'm a certified analyst, but I'm not a developer. I want to for anybody that's in the audience. I, mean, I, I would convey that except for configuring web services, which begins to be beyond my skill set. Um, you know, I. I know how to configure all of what you showed. How for somebody for somebody that is a, an analyst on the platform, how long do you think it would take to configure what you just showed? As long as as long as the HR folks know what they want, there you know they can say this is how I want the processes to run. How how long would it take you to configure that? Uh, you know, not you, you're an expert, but 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 somebody who's a middle of the road, mm -hmm. certified analyst on the platform. 
Yeah, I mean, the, the, the entire demo took about two days to build from start to finish. Uh, and it was built by uh, a 22 year old right out of college with uh, three months of work experience in Creatio uh, and actually no experience whatsoever in IT. Um, so I would say it's it's fairly low code. It it it's uh, uh, it, it's not at all a uh, the learning curve is very flat. And David, you mentioned this a couple of times, right? Uh, as long as we give the tools to create these objects very quickly, uh, we we provide you those page designer. We give you those workflows where you can create those workflows on the fly uh, and add new tasks as as and when it goes. Uh, it it's not a big big deal. The overall process only took two days. And, and, well, and when you so we didn't rehearse this. Um, when you initially said two days, I was surprised that it took two days. That was my my initial mm -hmm. reaction. But your point, your follow up was basically somebody brand new to the platform, right? Um, I, I'm looking at it and have no way of proving this, but you know, I I think it's bas It looks to me like I could do it in maybe four hours or so. Yes, right? yes. Is, is, is 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 my gut. I want to make one other point. Um, I want to emphasize the power of uh, those processes. What you call the the light? What did you? The dynamic case management. You, the DCM. I call those what did, lightly orchest. I call those gently orchestrated processes. Mm -hmm. Right. And and the importance of these for the audience is that I have a career of finding that organizations implement their IT platforms and they're brittle and they're the manacles and the ball and chain that I was talking about earlier for anybody in the organization that's a knowledge worker. This, this is a key to me, right? And so what I really love about this platform, and, and it's not the only one that has this kind of capability that we're looking at right here, but I really like the combination of what I call the lightly orchestrated process here, usually usually to give some guardrails, as you said, for knowledge workers in combination with the tightly structured processes and automations that we can build in, in studio that's got all the if-then branching and triggers that you were showing. It's the combination of the two that I, I think is so powerful uh, uh, in, in the platform. 100% right. And that actually addressed one of the questions we've been getting um, is around what skills uh, people need to have to be successful using low-code platforms. Um, and I think it was addressed really well. Uh, and and I would just echo the statement that the most challenging part of building out these tools is the ability to verbalize it, to you know meet with your group, to say out loud what it is that you're you're looking to achieve, what that process is, and then actually building it out into the tool where it's deployed and used is is the easy part in the experience that I have with uh, my customers. Um, Another hey, Eric, question we've had, yeah, Eric can, can I build on that? Like two specific skills that I think are helpful um, are one, one is people who can think in terms of what in the IT profession is called entity relationship diagrams. But just if you can take a piece of paper and draw bubbles of the relationships of candidate to CV to recruitment, that I think that's one of the key skills. If you can't think in relational terms, then, then, then are you probably, this probably isn't for you, but you probably shouldn't be in IT. And the other, the other is if you can do pseudocode, right? Like just logical thinking in terms of steps, that's another indicator that you can be very adept in, in these low code platforms. So I'm sorry, to, I, I just wanted to build on your, 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 your comments there. Yeah, no, I, I appreciate it. Um, and I know we're about to run short on time. So just a couple more questions we've had out there. Uh, and this is a good one. Um, if we can speak to how Creatio and low-code platforms uh, relate and interact with existing CRMs, there's going to be a lot of folks who already have something in place, which you know we're not. It's not going to be replaced. But how can platforms like Creatio play nice and work hand in hand with uh, CRMs and other systems that are uh, out there today and already in place? So Mandish or, or David. Uh, whoever wants to grab that yeah, one. I can, I can take the first step because we've been working extensively with many of our prospects that they have their own HR system that could be Workday or Remedy or Bamboo or whatever that may be. Uh, they may also have their own Salesforce instance from the 
from the sales perspective, right? They could have their own sales cloud. So we can come in very nice and clean. Remember, web services gives us the ability to connect with multiple systems. We are agnostic on how many web, web services connections that needs to happen. So we've been talking to many of our prospects that say, well, as and when uh, you know a, a, a order comes through the Salesforce sales cloud, we, we can push that data into Creatio. Creatio would do those non-standard workflows, maybe contract management, some other systems that are very tailored to that organization. And once those workflows are completed, we push that data back to Salesforce. So that is one instance of that. The other instance is coexisting with, with Workday and ServiceNow, for example. So because from Workday, the applicant tracking would come into Creatio, we would do all of the employee onboarding, kick off a ticket to ServiceNow to kick off the uh, the equipments and IT help desk. And then once that application is done, we would consolidate that back uh, and then continue with the rest of the application. So it is very easy for us to coexist with that existing ecosystem. And, and, and I would just add, Eric, that I was talking about five years ago, finding that low code wasn't really ready for the enterprise, right? I think one of the differences between then and now is that you know, all the vendors, and, and very much Creatio included, of course, um, they've, they've all moved to low code configuration of modern API methods, right? Or integration methods. So RESTful APIs, OAuth, I don't know how all those things work um, for sure, but it, it, as long as we're talking about relatively modern systems, they all they all talk nicely uh, with to each other with each other, and and I, I I think that's one of the developments that makes low code ready for the enterprise. Well, and then uh, another question we have, which I'll throw out there: uh, the demo that was showed is oriented towards a standard business flow. How flexible is Creatio for creating unorthodox processes? Uh, for example, if I need to create an app for clinical patient management, is a platform like Creatio flexible enough to achieve that? Yeah, to totally. Um, so because uh, we, we, you can create uh, unlimited custom objects. So for example, the candidate object that, that we are running this workflow on was not existing in Creatio. We had to build that inside of creation so it's a very simple process it's just the uh, it takes two buttons or two mouse clicks for you to create that uh, new object and then like i showed you previously with the page designer where you can drag and drop uh, to configure the page that that you would like so it's very easy for uh, uh, for us to build for unorthodox workflows uh, I'd, I'd say the boundaries are almost your imagination but i would point out that that can be dangerous right just because you could do something doesn't mean you should, right? So any process can be can be automated. I'm just you know, good design is is stepping back and and asking how much should be automated, not just um, uh, automating because you can. But yeah, I, I can't imagine any. We have not encountered any any workflow that we couldn't um, model and support. Couldn't. Um, with the Creatio platform, the kind of tools that we're looking at here. All right, excellent. Um, and I believe that's probably all the time that we have for this session. Uh, if anybody has any last minute questions or things that they'd like to drop in, um, we'll be more than happy to, to reach back out and make sure we get you answers to anything that might still be lingering out there. Um, and also this recording, we do these very regularly. Um, especially with our hero Nandish, who, who is uh, amazing at showing off the, the capabilities of low code. Um, so you can find a lot of different recordings of webinars and conversations that we have on our YouTube channel. Um, and we also welcome you to come to the site and, and explore uh, some of the things that we have to offer there, as well as uh, David's site at Keen360. Um, so again, I, I appreciate everybody joining today. Uh, thank you for your time. We had a good time. We hope uh, you guys felt it was well spent as well and look forward to speaking with some of you soon. Thanks so much. Thanks, everyone. Bye -bye. Thanks, everybody.